what a wonderful treat to have been taken to see the Orozco murals. Um, so grateful to Judith for arranging that and such a wonderful experience to, uh, to set us up for our afternoon. Um, so, um, I, it is my job to moderate the, um, this final panel, panel three, um, which is entitled Activism and Organization, the Role of Institutions in Refugee Scholar Rescue. And um, when I first heard about this, I thought it was going to be about institutions, as in universities, and got very worried, because I'm from Yale University, and I thought I should probably research the history of Yale University and, um, and scholar rescue. Um, but in fact, what we're actually talking about, interesting, isn't it? We're talking about the organizations which, in fact, help universities and help scholars um, come together in times when rescue is needed, and that's the theme of the next three um, presentations. Um, how we're going to do this is um, that I'm going to ask each of the panelists to come up in turn, and um, following the model just set so nicely for us by Anne, um, what, um, what we'll do is hear the presentation and then take questions which are directly and very specifically geared towards that presentation briefly. And then we'll move on to the next presentation. And then we will have time, I'm pretty sure, because there's, there's plenty of time um, this afternoon, we'll have time to gather everybody back together up here and both have them take your questions and also, I'm hoping, perhaps have questions for each other because uh, these papers really do intersect in interesting ways and I'm hoping we might hear some interesting uh, discussion about this uh, this collection of topics that we're now going to deal with. Um, so let us begin by asking Matthias Dula to come up to do his presentation. And as you know, we have excellent bios. Um, I'm looking at the same thing that you are. Um, he is a sociologist from the University of Graz in Austria. Matthias. Yes, thank you. And thank you first also to the organizers for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Right, so in my presentation today, I'm talking about the first large fellowship program for social scientists, humanities scholars and artists from Eastern Europe, from communist countries, to spend research and study visits in the USA uh, and other Western countries too. That was run by the Ford Foundation from the mid-1950s onwards and through the 60s and to a different degree also until the end of the communist period. So this is the first piece uh, for me in a new project in which I try to deliver a rather descriptive account of the policies behind the East European Fellowship Program from the perspective of the Ford Foundation. And it is based on archival research in the Rockefeller Archive Center. And building on that, I will then end by outlining some further questions that I hope to answer in future research. So what is the... Ford Foundation, how did the Ford Foundation envision its own role in global and domestic politics? Um, Ford Foundation is, a, as you well know, is a private philanthropic um, foundation that was established by the owners of the Ford Motor Company in 1936, and it grew to be the financially largest philanthropic organization in the world by the late 1940s. The self-identified goal of the foundation was according to the prerequisites of a philanthropic organization, the advancement of human welfare. Um, in the 1940s, then, with the enormous amount of money that it had at its disposal, and also a highly elitist network of politicians, diplomats, bureaucrats, um, academics, and businessmen, it began this, to take this uh, very ambitious goal also serious and developed a distinctly global agenda. Now, in order to have these um, ambitious uh, ideas of spreading peace and development across the world, it focused particularly on knowledge production through the support of modern empirical uh, social sciences, both at home and abroad. The social scientists held, in their view, an enormous potential to solve all sorts of human problems by causing, um, the, by tackling the causes, excuse me, of war and other social ills, and not just their effects. By that, it was also believed that the spread of the social sciences would somehow contribute also to the democratization of non-liberal societies. Now, needless to say that this uh, global agenda was also linked to America's interventionist foreign policies and the Cold War to that, uh, at that time. But to somehow grasp the mindsets of these actors, I think one should have in mind that there was an exceptionally large degree of optimism and I think genuine belief that 
rational action of Western enlightened institutions could um, do something to solve many of uh, humankind's problem. Um, now, the foundation's most enduring activities were directed to the so-called developing countries of Asia and Africa, but it was also, to a lesser extent, concerned with the so-called second world, in the terminology of its time, the communist world, and here primarily in the realm of cultural diplomacy. Um, the earliest program from the Fourth Foundation concerning communist countries was called the Free Russia Fund from 1948. that was later renamed the East European Fund, and it was since 1950 led by George F. Cannon, the influential diplomat on Russian affairs and one of the architects of the policy of containment. Um, the foundation allocated a few million dollars to the East European Fund, which Cannon used to support Russian-speaking intellectuals in the USA in the first place. Um, he had been aware that the Russian linguistic communities um, that uh, on, in Europe that had upheld a very vivid cultural production in several European countries after they had fled the Russian Revolution. And he uh, had been aware of the importance that this community had also to challenge the Soviet regime at home. Now, after these centers had folded in Europe um, before and during the Second World War, he thought that the USA ought to offer them a new home. Um, his program consisted of financial and practical support for Russian refugee scholars, writers, students, and others, and uh, more importantly, the running of a Russian language publishing house, the Chekhov Publishing House, that uh, uh, published Russian, uh, ling la Russian language literary works and also translations of Western books into Russian language. Now, some of the books uh, published by Chekhov, um, such as um, uh, the poems of Anna Akhmatova were censored in the Soviet Union at the time and thus were out of stock and not um, available. Um, others were newly written works by Russian writers that could be, that could, should help also maintaining this pre-revolutionary Russian literary tradition in America. And most importantly, Cannon said in an interview later in the early 1970s that the Chekhov Publishing Company, uh, quote, had a very deep effect on the publishing in the Soviet Union by virtue of competition, unquote. Um, Cannon and his teams were, again, quote, also concerned to radiate back to the Soviet Union the impression that America was a country sympathetic and receptive to Russian cultural activities, a country in which these activities could be pursued better than they could be in the Soviet Union, unquote. Now, um, Akhmatova's works are an example um, that this uh, uh, strategy really worked. Sometimes they were reissued in the Soviet Union after the East European Fund realized the publication in the US um, in order to have, um, avoid having a smuggled version in the countries and also in order to um, avoid the stigma of censoring internationally respected Russian literature. Now, after all, um, successful in Canon's own view, the Ford Foundation discontinued these activities. The East European Fund in 1953, most probably because it felt it was too closely connected to Cold War policies with which it did not want to be associated that clearly. Um, but instead, a few years later, a new East European program was introduced. Um, the general goal to support East European intellectual as the main targets in the cultural diplomacy towards the communist countries um, maintained, um, but the tactics moved. Um, first, from targeting refugee intellectuals to targeted intellectuals that lived and worked inside the communist countries, and second, to move uh, the emphasis from the Soviet Union to the East European satellite state, or what the foundation <coughs> called secondary communist countries. Now, the reason for the first shift is rather obvious. To influence intellectuals within the campus is more effective than targeting the diaspora. And the second shift from the Soviet Union uh, rested on, from the Soviet Union to the Eastern Europe, sorry, uh, rested on the insight that East European satellite states um, displayed at that time very strong signs of emancipating themselves from the Soviet domination after Stalin's death and sought support from Western powers in this endeavor. Now, in this situation, the Ford Foundation felt that it had a historical chance and also an obligation uh, to fulfill this wish and offered a large-scale fellowship program for East European intellectuals to spend study and research visits in the USA and other Western countries too. Um, the hope was that upon return, these intellectuals should bring home a more positive image of the West and help also moving their countries closer to the West and further away from the Soviet Union. 
Now, support for refugee scholars did continue also when crises appeared, such as in the aftermath of the Hungarian Revolution in 1956, and once again after the suppression of the Prague Spring in 1968, and also the accompanying crackdown on liberals and intellectuals in Poland. But the, the whole idea of uh, refugee support um, was of lesser importance compared to the, the bigger ambitions that it can be uh, pursued with the East European Fellowship Program. Now, the earliest, largest, and most important fellowship program was signed with Poland in 1956. And this country had under its uh, new party leader, Gomulka, accomplished uh, a small revolution during the time concerning its relation to the Soviet Union and initiated a rather radical reform movement that also included much better relations to the West. Um, the Polish un uh, universities and the intellectual scene um, were both uh, very well developed and notoriously anti-Soviet and even anti-communist um, and were thus an ideal, an ideal target for the Ford Foundation to advance their cause. With the help of some very well-known social scientists, among them Paul Lazarsfeld, um, the National Security Advisor, speaking of Brzezinski, and also Henry Kissinger, at that time still a political scientist, um, they undertook several trips to Poland and negotiated a very large-scale fellowship program for Polish intellectuals, the majority of which were social scientists and humanities scholars, but also journalists, government officials, and later also uh, natural scientists. Um, the program between 1957 and 61, some 330 Polish intellectuals received such fellowships, um, usually for the period of one year. Some but more than half of them chose to uh, spend their stays in the US, the other half in other West European countries, mostly UK, Germany, and France. Um, now, these numbers make clear that these days affected quite a large segment of the Polish social science. Um, seen and thus had a major intellectual impact there. But what was most remarkable was that the selection of these candidates was exclusively in the hands of the Ford Foundation, um, who tried to base their decisions on academic merits exclusively and not on the political grounds. Now, in, oh sorry, too fast. In around the years 1960, 1961, this program ran into problems the Polish government, which slowly retreated here from its liberal ventures, increasingly tried to gain more control of the selection of candidates, something that contradicted the initial agreement. And the program was um, eventually discontinued in 62 and a little bit later resumed again. Um, some 38 scholars were uh, still sent in the term of the 1960s, so we have a total of 368 uh, fellows from Poland from the 50s to the end of the 1960s. Um, Yugoslavia was the second uh, country with which an agreement was signed one year later. Um, it was quite similar in many respects. Um, the political preconditions in Yugoslavia of anti-Sovietism and also West orientation were here realized even earlier and stronger since the 1948 Tito-Stalin split. The intellectual landscape was a little bit less developed maybe than in Poland. Um, although the Communist Party in Yugoslavia had been supporting the social scientists already for a couple of years. Different from Poland, Yugoslav intellectuals were by and large anti-Soviet but not anti-communist, and which had much to do with the legitimacy of uh, the so socialist rule in comparatively liberal Yugoslavia. Um, but in the end of the 1960s, 188 uh, Yugoslav social scientists, humanities scholars and artists had received Ford Foundation fellowships. Different from Poland, this selection was uh, organized jointly by a Yugoslav committee and the Ford Foundation. Um, now, in the mid-1960s, several other countries also tried to follow. Um, a Hungarian program was signed with um, 1963, which was also rather sizable with 145 fellows, roughly half of them social scientists. And Czechoslovakia also tried to benefit from the foundation in the face of liberalization in the mid-60s, but could not sign a deal. The Ford Foundation itself was interested to advance negotiations with Romania during the early Ceausescu years, but also could not sign a deal. Uh, instead, a few Bulgarians received scholarship in the 1960s. Now here you have an overview of the numbers awarded fellowships in each, con in each country and also the amount of dollars spent by the Ford Foundation to these programs. Um, 
you see that Poland stands out in terms of numbers followed by Yugoslavia. Um, the number of Americans going to East European countries was much smaller. Only Poland with 29 had a, a, a certain degree of mutuality, let's say. And below you also see numbers for the USSR. This has been actually quite a, a different story um, and was not the program run by the Ford Foundation itself, but the Ford Foundation contributed to other programs. There was a 1958 Inter-University Committee on Travel Grants uh, that was set up between the US and the Soviet uh, governments, um, and later also the um, American Council of Learned Societies had a, a program exchange program between the academies of sciences from um, the US and the Soviet Union. So the, the dollar numbers you see is just, are just the uh, um, Ford Foundation, if the Ford Foundation money and the number of uh, fellows is the total number of fellows within that program. Now, after, from 1966 onwards, this whole program um, was subjected to another shift in policy when George Bundy, the former national security advisor to Johnson and Kennedy, became president of the Ford Foundation. What changes here, in short, is that these old broad spectrum academics exchanges to East Europeans were discontinued, and the new program tried to achieve more thematically focused, more collaborative research exchanges, and also emphasized um, institution building within the communist countries. So that is to say this initial idea of simply exposing East European intellectuals to uh, life in the West in the hope for political repercussions ends here in the 1960s. Um, good, now this was in broad strokes the, the story how the East European Fellowship Program started from the perspective of the Ford Foundation. The really interesting question in historical hindsight is, of course, what effect did the program actually have in Eastern Europe? Um, the Ford Foundation itself was, of course, concerned with this question and produced a number of internal reports about it. it generally thought that uh, the goals were achieved. There was, of course, an immediate goal of the program to establish closer relation between Eastern and Western intellectuals and to improve the mutual understanding of the blocs and to reduce the isolation of East Europeans. And this was obviously achieved by the mere fact that several hundreds of intellectuals did spend extended research days in foreign countries and also established longer lasting personal relationships that often exceeded the time of the fellowship. Also, the program was judged very important from American scholars dealing with Eastern Europe to increase their understanding of the region uh, through personal contacts with the local intellectuals. Um, and finally, on an academic or intellectual level, um, some Polish authors in particular have convincingly stressed that this exchange program had a very significant impact on the advancement, for example, of empirical social research methods within Poland. But concerning the more ambitious political goal, that is that exposure to Western life would influence intellectual elites in such a way that they would contribute to liberalization of the, and democratization of their societies. Um, the answer is a bit more difficult. Again, there are um, voices within the, within the Ford Foundation archives that believe that this has been achieved, but um, a definitive, definitive answer is hard to find. Now, um, in my future research, I would try to um, approach this question a bit more closely in three directions. The first relates to the actual intentions and rationales of the communist governments who signed this exchange agreement with the Ford Foundation. I, accept, I suggested that the two original programs, the Yugoslav and the Polish ones, were indeed driven by the very same intention on the side of the communist regimes and the American counterparts to instigate also a westernization of the intellectual elites. Now, if that were true, this would mean that the Ford exchanges offered a diplomatic loophole to pursue a strategy that could not have been pursued openly. Therefore, here I would like to consult the archives of the Polish and the Yugoslav communist parties and find out about their actual motivations behind it. And second, the experience of this research and uh, study visit to the US and other Western countries has to be understood more fully than the archival material reveals. Unfortunately, the written reports in the Ford Foundation archives have not been made available uh, so far, but I intend to uh, pursue 
a number of oral history interviews with former fellows and um, to have like a larger picture of how they experienced uh, this from first hand. And third, though similar in quite many respects, um, Poland and Yugoslavia seem to uh, display some important differences. Um, most strikingly, it appears that the Polish academic intelligentsia had been a major carrier of anti-communist resistance, while the Yugoslav intellectuals did not exhibit a similar inclination to dissidents. Um, though often being critical observers and commentators, they usually remained on this revisionist pole of anti-communist criticism. And comparing these different reactions between these two countries does, I think, offers also a chance to assess the actual effect that the fellowship program had on anti-communist stances. Thank you. Thanks. This regards Yugoslavia. I'm wondering if there was any exchanges regarding economic reform or anything like that, because obviously um, Yugoslavia under Tito was more open. Um, and I say specifically, and this obviously is uh, the imprint of how far right um, everyone has gone, particularly this country. In the 70s, Fortune magazine praised the worker management um, of experiment in Yugoslavia, ironically, specifically focusing on Energo Invest, which is based in uh, Sarajevo. So I'm wondering if you came across anything like that. Can I answer right away? Uh, yes, absolutely, you're completely right. Uh, um, management has been, as I said, from the late 60s onwards, and in particular in the 70s and 80s, uh, the Ford Foundation concentrated on three topics. They wanted to have it thematically focused. And the largest and most important was management. And Yugoslavia had been the case where they learned that this is really um, um, something to dig deeper, because there were these you know, um, experiments in self-government at the time, in which Americans were very interested and also comparative studies on economic uh, behavior. So management was one of the target areas for the exchanges from the 70s onwards, also with uh, hun Hungary and other countries. But Yugoslavia and Hungary are the biggest ones. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, thank you for that. I, um, I would like to learn more about the, um, I don't know much about Yugoslavia of that time, but I know that 1968 in Poland was uh, mainly famous for, infamous for its uh, expulsion of, of Jewish intellectuals, or Jews in general, that was the biggest anti-Semitic campaign uh, in the after-war Poland. Uh, can you speak a little bit more, A, about the role of Ford Foundation in this process in, in, as a, as a pot potential refuge uh, provider for these scholars? And B, uh, if that is also com a comparable um, category in your analysis of uh, relations between Poland and Yugoslavia within your research. Yes. Um, I'm not sure if I, if I can answer really whole, uh, covering the, the whole story because um, I have concentrated on the fellowship program. Um, but the archival material that I looked into was all related to the East European program in which um, refugee help of that time also fell. And the number of um, documents is much smaller. There, there were programs to, to um, refugee help after 1968 for Polish intellectuals, for Czech intellectuals, like there were for after 1956 for Hungarian intellectuals. Um, but it seems to me from, from what I read in the archives that this was not a politically contested issue. There was money given, um, and they helped uh, in short term, um, but it was not that much debated on. Um, the second question r relating to comparison uh, Polish and uh, Poland and Yugoslavia. Well, um, on the one hand, sure, in Yugoslavia we do never have uh, uh, such a crisis, political crisis, um, during the whole period. So that's why the program also continues to move on rather smoothly as opposed to the Polish program that had its difficulties already in, in 1960. Um, concerning the question if uh, Jewish scholars were affected more often, I do not have an answer yet. Uh, it's 
rather difficult to collect uh, the data set, but I'm working on that and will hopefully have some results in the future. I have a question. I wanted to say something about a Ford Foundation program here in the U.S. Um, from the late 70s to the early 80s. Would now be the time to do that, or should I wait until later? Well, you're done, so <laughs> go ahead. <Yeah. laughs> okay, well, um, in about 1975, the Ford Foundation funded a program here under the auspices of an agency called the American Council for Emigres and the Professions, which actually was founded by Elsie Staudinger, who was the wife of Hans Staudinger that um, Judith mentioned earlier, and also Alvin Johnson and a number of other people. Anyway, the Ford Foundation gave a major grant to this agency for something called the Program for Soviet Emigre Scholars. And um, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with it, but as the name suggests, it worked with people who were already here as refugees. They had to have like high-level degrees, the Kandidat Nauk or the Doktor Nauk. Um, in some cases, if a person was an author or an artist, an exception was made. And it did a wide range of things to help them get jobs and become established professionally here in the United States. Um, both practical support, as you said, and also um, counseling and just a whole range of services. So um, I just wanted to mention that. Um. Okay, one more question, and then we'll uh, we'll move on to Scott Krauser. Great. Um, thanks. Thanks for the paper. I was. I think it fits in perfectly in this new Cold War history, is which stress the circulation of experts and um, the cooperation between experts across the Iron Curtain. And um, I was wondering, um, for the, for in the in the field of the history of international law, it's that the that the um, uh, the contribution of Eastern European um, law making has been written systematically out of this history and it's uh, rediscovered at the moment and when reading a paper I was wondering if this might also be the case with the history of higher education um, that has been for political reasons really left out of of our, our of, of our picture of high of how um, higher education developed after 1945 and if the Ford Foundation and this program might be an avenue well, to write it, to integrate it and to write it in again. Yes, thank you. This is precisely what I try to do. I think that um, all, as far as I'm aware, all comparative histories of higher education or of the social sciences that I know do not include the Eastern European story at all. There are, of course, some papers that focus particularly with, with, with Eastern Europe, clearly, but um, in, not in a comparative in a comparative framework, and this is what, what I try to do. Thank you. Uh, maybe to, to the comment there. Uh, this sounds uh, a lot like in continuation of what I presented at the, as the first part, the East European Fund, the, the focus on, on emigrates. So this apparently continued longer than I thought. Thank you. Then uh, this line of, of support continued longer than I thought, I said. Yes, OK. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just read on the internet that you just won a huge prize. I don't know if it's huge, yes, but I won <laughs> some. <laughs> Tell the people what you won. Uh, well, uh, I won, wait, sorry, I'm, I'm horrible at multitasking. <laughs> uh, where, where we go, here. Uh, I, uh, my, my book manuscript was um, honored the, or, or awarded the Willy Brandt Prize in Contemporary History. Uh, which is also a nice segue. Uh, this is why um, I'm actually particularly uh, glad that um, I can now present today on something slightly different, sort of like as a spin-off, sort of is my break uh, from Willy Brandt right now. And then I, as I was shuffling around the corridor uh, earlier today, I realized that there is a plaque dedicated to Willy Brandt. So he's been following me, <laughs> but I'm still, do check it out uh, here. There is a chair named uh, after in Billy Brandt's honor, just to show that also sort of like the um, social circles that we're talking about, the networks, you know, like the name, they are converging. Today, uh, as a sort of like, uh, for, for the intents and purposes of this presentation, I want to highlight uh, the people sort of like what will become Willy Brandt's first PR staff, the people behind him. He's sort of like the most famous, but also youngest, 
uh, remigre in um, German history, or political remigre, let's put it uh, this way. So, um, but focus on the institutions that have helped these people um, through their rather astounding careers. Because among today's NGO community, the International Rescue Committee, IRC, boasts a storied history. It can trace its roots back to the Emergency Rescue Committee, ERC, over seven uh, decades before. Its wartime activities, as we've heard uh, uh, numerous times, uh, gave hope to refugees from Nazism in what uh, writer Leo Lania, um, a Weltbühne veteran, uh, called his darkest hour, simply and rather starkly. In 1904, this is, uh, also uh, came up yesterday, was ERC staff in Marseille that had helped hundreds of entrapped refugees flee by providing visas to the United States. It was Varian Fry who has become the public face of these courageous efforts, culminating in his recognition as righteous among nations, but also with a street uh, named after him in Berlin's rather bizarrely uh, rebuilt city center on Potsdamer Platz. Um, today's IRC places itself in his tradition, defining its mission as helping, quote, people whose lives and livelihoods are shattered by conflict and helping them to regain control of their future. Yet scrutiny through the lens of knowledge uh, uh, exposes how this tale of heroic and individual humanitarianism has been streamlined. Archival research on the ERC's uh, associates shows uh, how the committee's agenda derived from socialist exile politics. Moreover, this circle, this network, uh, later enlisted the IRC, the post-war successor, as a combatant against Stalinism and the Cold War. So to put it in other ways, uh, that, the, uh, that the street named after Varian Fry and the wall, which ran sort of uh, the building you can see in the background, that would have been already been uh, deemed East Berlin, that they are not only in close proximity to each other, but interrelated. Hence, the ERC grew not, on, not through, uh, or solely through wide uh, acceptance of human rights, but as a political project, a transatlantic network steeped in anti-fascist exile politics. This paper focuses on the network's, uh, network's members' association with the ERC-IRC, first as beneficiaries and then as boosters. It thus highlights how the IRC's leadership understood humanitarianism as anti-totalitarianism in action. Moreover, such interpretation derived from uh, this network's or the, the network's members lived experience. The lens of knowledge provides a perspective to analyze these processes of cultural trans, uh, translation and the obstacles this, these processes encountered, encountered in both directions, from Europe to America and back. Hence, this paper retraces the physical and political journeys of the network's members through their stations in pre-war Paris, wartime New York, and post-war Berlin. In 1938 Paris, the German-speaking resistance took another blow. When the executive of the SPD in exile split over the best strategy to, against Nazism, disclosures that executive member Paul Hertz had collaborated with a cl clandestine uh, group uh, called Neubeginnen uh, rankled his colleagues. Neubeginnen adv had advocated a unity front between communists and social democrats uh, against fascism. In an August meeting, uh, his SPD colleagues, uh, <clears throat> uh, Hertz could not um, overcome the ingrained anti-communism of his SPD comrades and split in controversy. Hertz then moved to the United States to build up a local Neubeginnen franchise repurposed, renamed as the American Friends of German Freedom, the AFGF. His friend and former SPD coordinator of Prussian press policy, Hans Hirschfeld, then accused Social Democrats of, quote, sabotaging leftist unity against Hitler. Little over, little over a year later, the fight against Nazism turned into a fight for survival. Hirschfeld volunteered for the French army. Uh, in the most unusual circumstances, his family stayed behind in an internment camp, Catus, as en désirable. Um, in a letter to his wife, Hirschfeld introduced new terminology to vindicate his military service. He spoke of fighting, quote, fascist states of violence that make us unfree. Here you can see already a semantic shift. There's little talk about um, socialism or revolution, but there is a, um, 
recognition or acknowledgement that stopping the Nazi war machine required mass conscription armies, and thus arguably broader, more inclusive terms. Yet the same day when Her uh, Hirschfeld write, wrote this letter, the evacuation commenced June 10th, 1940, signaling the Third Republic's imminent collapse. The Hirschfelds managed to flee Vichy, France through local and international support. This is a convoluted, uh, circuitous route, um, Filmreif, but it was New York-based Neubeginn leadership, AFGF leadership around Karl B. Frank and Hertz that played a crucial role uh, for uh, the, uh, the Hirschfeld's escape. The AFGF uh, archiv archivists raised funds and compiled lists of eligible uh, refugees trapped in Pétain's Etat Francais. The Hirschfeld counted among the ERC's beneficiaries who secured an emergency visa from the U.S. consulate Marseille. After the uh, dangerous uh, uh, journey over the Pyrenees border uh, that had claimed Walter Benjamin's life just a few weeks earlier, the Hirschfelds traversed Francois Spain to the port of Lisbon. I mean, we've talked about this uh, established yet precarious route. Uh, not that the Estado Novo in Lisbon was a particularly um, good place to be in, or pleasant place. Uh, hence, they arrived finally at, uh, in New York City's harbor on March 7th, 1941 months before this window of opportunity slammed shut. It, uh, while Her Frank, Hertz, Hertz, and Hirschfeld reached the physical safety that had eluded so many, eight years of leftist, often radical, uh, activism had left seemingly little impact on the Third Reich. Instead, it had left them politically marginalized. Upon arrival, Hirschfeld could count as his only victory that he secured the survival of his family and himself. Yet it was in wartime Manhattan that witnessed a transformation of transmatic, traumatic experience into valuable knowledge and a staggering political transformations through contacts uh, within New Deal America. Hatz established himself as an auditor CPA, enabling him to quickly apply his legal training in an environment demanding credentials foreign to him. Intellectually, Hatz found uh, time to develop new interests that bucked grand theories of revolution. Hatz, for instance, spoke at credit union branches across Southern California, discussing the benefits of um, provisions of the German Genossenschaftsbankensystem uh, with local uh, credit union members. The US uh, credit union system promised little utopian appeal, but incremental improvement of everyday lives. Hirschfeld's time in the United States shows how AFGF activists profited from close contact with local emigre scholars. Hirschfeld found a source of income here as a research assistant at the New School, uh, while emigre scholars advanced uh, quickly up the hierarchy of knowledge of mainstream U.S. society. The reception of Franz L. Neumann's uh, 1942 behemoth exemplifies uh, the em this newfound cultural cur currency of emigres. Subtitled, The Structure and Practice of National Socialism, this book interpreted the Nazi regime as a type of totalitarianism in which competing factions vied for influence. Materially, this monograph secured new position for emigres. The Office of Strategic Services, OSS, uh, enlisted the Frankfurt School's expertise for the American war effort. Led by Neumann, the Central European Division's research and analysis section formed both an intelligence agency and a think tank. Among the numerous emigre hires was Hirschfeld, who assessed high-ranking civil servants' degree of collusion with the Nazi regime, his former colleagues. Work at the United States' first centralized intelligence agency gave Hirschfeld a steady sal uh, salary and the chance to forge contacts that would prove crucial in the post-war era. Moreover, it reflected his group's uh, changed political outlook. The AFGF chose to fight Nazi Germany under a flag promising, at least, uh, liberal democracy and capitalism deliberately. In 1940, Hertz had professed publicly Freedom and democracy will only be restored when Hitler has been destroyed militarily. German refugees want to contribute to this task. This declaration derived both from experiences in the United States and disillusionment with Soviet policies. The NKVD's brutal silencing of non-orthodox communist groups during the Spanish Civil War and the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact had convinced the AFGF that <clears throat> Russian politics have nothing in common with international socialism any longer. And here the adjective is telling, right? It's 
Russian, not Soviet. Frank expressed uh, the Neubeginnen's new anti-totalitarian anti ethos uh, for, in his vision for the post-war era. He named, quote, American leadership and the particular rights of democratic freedom that the United States proclaimed as the best hopes for a stable German post-war democracy. While the AFGF's definition of socialism had shifted, the group's resilience derived from their enduring identity as German-speaking socialists. This identity itself warrants closer scrutiny, particularly in light of grave personal losses that Herz and Hirschfeld had suffered. The end of the war brought gruesome confirmation that close relatives had been murdered at Auschwitz and Theresienstadt. Yet the lens of knowledge can help to explain why both ac activists eventually returned to Berlin, a Berlin that barely resembled the city they had, had, been, had to leave 16 years earlier. In 1949, the former ER ERC liaison in Turkey, Ernst Reuter, visited New York. This, uh, he visited New York as Berlin's mayor-elect in the opening Cold War. And this is a meeting, sure, this is a Cold War spectacle, but it's also fraught with uh, potential ironies. For instance, uh, Reuter had once, uh, one time, served as a Soviet People's Commissar in Zamara, Russia, in revolutionary Russia. And he now received a thunderous reception as the public face of Western resistance to communism during the Berlin airlift. While the New York City mayor uh, lauded Reuter as an icon for, quote, the cause of world freedom, the so social democrat Reuter reached out to local German-speaking emigres. Reuter exhorted his fellow wartime emigres to join him in Germany for building a liberal democracy that earned Western society's acceptance. AFGF members played a crucial role in this initi initiative to buttress Berlin's blockaded Western sectors and to reinvent the SPD, the Social Democratic Party of Germany, into a center-left, pro-Western party. Consequently, Reuter appointed Hertz as, a, uh, as coordinator for Marshall Plan programs and Hirschfeld as a, as, a, as a municipal public relations director. In these posts, both former revolutionary socialists refashioned West Berlin as a Cold War model city. This is noteworthy <laughs> since this um, Cold War model city is little than, more than a field of rubble uh, that stretches from uh, the Reichstag to the Wannsee. You know, like from the um, vestige, the burnt shell of the first German democracy to the site of the implementation of the wartime genocide. Um, <clears throat> but before these trans migrants could apply their knowledge in Berlin, they had to find their bearings in an alienating country, or a country of birth. Strikingly, they relied on the narrative of Berlin as the outpost of freedom uh, to first vindicate their own return. Hertz, uh, Hertz described his dizzying first impressions to his family uh, as, quote, life within rubble. Across the street, as far as I can see, rubble. But Hertz eagerly ag uh, added that he was sure that the border between freedom and slavery ran across Potsdamer Platz. Such certainties also dissipated uh, Hirschfeld's reservations, who resorted to biblical imagery uh, to vindicate his return to skeptical emigre friends in New York. Saul became Paul. I stayed here because I am convinced that we in Berlin complete a crucial political task unlike anywhere else on earth. As a next step, both administrators sought to popularize this narrative of Berlin as the heroic city of freedom to a domestic and international public alike. Hertz oversaw disbursement of subsidies that resuscitated West Berlin's once uh, vaunted industrial sectors. While these measures set up a, a costly precedent for the future, I mean, this is like, like, you know, like subsidy capitalism, it was uh, transfers from the West that helped curb the rampant unemployment that resulted from the loss or rupture of local markets, local supply chains, etc. Hirschfeld, uh, on the other hand, coordinated a transnational PR campaign for over a decade that rebranded uh, Berlin or West Berlin as a city of freedom. This campaign left physical manifestations such as the Free University, uh, Radio Free Berlin, and the Freedom Bell. Uh, the Freedom Bell is a replica of Philadelphia's Liberty Bell, mm, which simply, uh, sub, uh, well, etched in it is the um, 
are words taken from Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, that this nation shall have a new birth of freedom, simply supplanting nation with the world. So talk about basically exporting uh, imagery deep, deeply ingrained in the American political culture. At the 1950 dedication ceremony for this uh, replica in Berlin, uh, <clears throat> speakers like Reuter invoked the terms free and freedom over 70 times, while 100,000 radio stations, supposedly, uh, radio stations carried the broadcast worldwide. For recasting the former Nazi empire's capital as the outpost of freedom, Hirschfeld relied on his Manhattan era contacts that yielded substantial yet covert American funds. These entire pageants were underwritten by various American governmental and non-governmental uh, sources. We will talk about this uh, in a minute. We can talk about it in the Q&A too. Because in post-war Berlin, freedom and fighting communism had become synonymous for these AFGF alumni. Renewed links to the IRC show how the, this aid organization shared this passion. Starting in the 1950s, the IRC started a Project Berlin that blurred the lines between humanitarian relief and political activism. Mayor Reuter founded an eponymous foundation for funds he had raised during his triumphal US tours, among them uh, over a million uh, Deutschmarks raised, quote, through International Rescue Committee New York. Board director Hertz and board members Hirschfeld and IRC uh, chair Leo Chern oversaw the Marienfeld shelter for refugees um, <clears throat> while uh, masking clandestine funds to fight the cultural Cold War. So, I mean, I, I uh, chose both uh, quite consciously this uh, sort of like official photo, i.e. PR photo, of the rescue shelter, which uh, shows the processing of refugees uh, with, the, uh, with the new infrastructure provided by these donations. Um, as a German sort of like Ordnung muss sein, and sort of like you can stand in line, but also at the clock and uh, enjoy a sunny day in, in Berlin. Um, while, um, <clears throat> yeah, the, um, what, what, what they, uh, Leo Chern used the foundations, the Reuter Foundation's broad bylaws to cloak a large, large donation by the Ford Foundation uh, to the Congress of Cultural Freedom, namely its um, struggling, financially struggling uh, literary outfit, um, Der Monat. Um, as you can see by the list of contributors, you know, like this is pretty high class. These covert uh, political transactions within a philanthropic foundation indicate how anti-totalitarian activism had become synonymous with humanitarian aid for the network's members. Moreover, these transfers illustrate how board members such as Herz, Hirschfeld, and Chern viewed the Cold War through the anti-totalitarian anti perspective they had drawn from their own biographies. So some concluding remarks. These involuntary migrants profited at least three times from a reassessment of their knowledge that had been traditionally uh, often ignored. Close association with the ERC-IRC helped them first to escape Nazi-occupied Europe. Moreover, the ERC succeeded in rescuing, rescuing over 2,000 refugees through its contacts both to US bureaucracy but also within socialist exile circles. In the context of the Grand Alliance against Nazism, the US government ascribed considerable relevance to these exiled leftists for its own war effort. Under the bipolar post-war order, West Berlin voters then eagerly adapted, adapt, adopted this network's propagandistic offerings to, of a Cold War democracy as it promised anti-communist continuity but also the chance to ignore the most incriminating legacies of the most recent past. Yet the precarious physical journeys had left a deep impression on the activists themselves. Over the span of 15 years, 1938 to 53, this group exhibited a curious, but also as effective mixture of adaptability and resilience. It is a Erfahrungsgemeinschaft, a um, mem uh, um, community of experience of uh, traumata that redefined its political outlook from anti-fascism to anti-totalitarianism. 
Now, this is a semantic expansion, but this semantic expansion defined the agenda for, of both the a AF, GF, and the IRC under the Cold War paradigm. Hence, the shifting perspective exemplifies how knowledge remains linked to personal experience. Regarding resilience, retention of an identity as German-speaking socialists proved the necessary prerequisite for joining the minority of emigres who actually returned. The perspective of knowledge uh, illuminates the tra trajectory of marginalized refugees to transatlantic power brokers, scrutinizing both a group's intellectual offerings and the reception among differing audiences allow grasping these exchanges as a two-way road. These careers highlight both the circumstances under which knowledge can become a precious commodity and how well-connected groups used it to embark on astounding careers. Focus on the knowledge dimension uh, of, a I of the interactions between IRC and AFGF, hence highlight the mechanics and power of cultural translation in new detail. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Okay, questions specific to Scott's paper. One over here. Yeah, I'm interested in their stance uh, during the two years, 45 to 47, when the Morgenthau plan mentality was working in American uh, ideas about what Germany should do. They just keep quiet and wait till the change, or were they pushing in any facet for what they would be more comfortable with as a Germany to go back to? Yeah, I mean, that, it, it is an excellent question. And um, it's since it's not one of their most successful ventures, uh, you know, like, you know, like as soon as they revert back to their stance as German-speaking emigres or German politicians, they didn't have a lot of standing. You'd have some standing if you were a war, war veteran, but not as if you're seen as a exponent of a beaten enemy in the World War, especially after you know, like, um, all the various crimes of the Nazis come, come to light. And they start a PR campaign um, which you know, like has these mid-century style cartoons of, um, I, I don't have it un unfortunately here, here in the presentation, but where there is a New York Times reader, um, male in the, in the sort of like, uh, w w what's it, um, suits, uh, zoot suits of the day, uh, you know, like reading the news and it's like, uh, all Germans uh, should pay for this and you see some wretched looking em em emaciated victims uh, clearly of the camps and one utters don't forget some of us are german too so and this campaign doesn't really uh take off um and hence i also think that this is one of the the takeaways that they take from it is to then think about its most uh, successful if we actually manage to shift the perception of American elites, and that's what they're doing in Cold War Berlin. But so yeah, it's a it's a very illustrative, even a failure um, can be telling. Thank you. Maybe one more question, which you have. Well, thank you. I have a very short question. Could you maybe, it would be kind if you could elaborate a little bit more on the connection between Hertz and Hir Hirschfeld with the um, ERC or I, IRC, so because um, I, I didn't really get what what which role they played. Sure. Wait, the, the connection between them or the the, the, the ERC? The connection between them and the ERC. Okay. So um, what what happens is that the ERC, uh, as far as I understand, uh, is is able. Um, you know, like these, are, these are small organizations uh, numerically that also can carry a lot of, um, um, yeah, or, you know, like personal clout. And uh, Frank, uh, whom I mentioned, uh, actually succeeds in uh, putting names on the lists of eligible, eligible refugees. So that's an incredible amount of, of power there. And uh, Hertz is. Um, influential in contributing to that list, drawing up that list, th those names. And um, I can only assume that he, he brought in, uh, added the Hirschfelds to this list because he sends then uh, instructions to uh, Hirschfeld in um, 
at that point stuck in Marseille is like, this is how you fill it out. This is the, the ERC's guide to filling out these um, um, uh, US um, bureaucratic forms. working. I hear you. It's working. Uh, so, look, I'm learning an enormous amount today, and, and, and this panel brings out kind of so vividly the embeddedness of the institutions that you're looking at, in this case the ERC, IRC, um, in other broader geopolitical dynamics. And in some ways, it's so obvious in the last two cases that um, it makes it clear that while there's also deep embeddedness of these institutions in the wartime period that we heard about in the first panel, it's less kind of less obvious. But so th this is kind of outside of your area of research. Just when you think about the IRC's trajectory in kind of a post-war world, and I, I know you haven't done the research on it, how does one think about the kind of disembedding and then re-embedding of, of an institution like the IRC in the refugee rescue area? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, like I don't, I don't you know, like I don't want to, you know, like, um, I mean, I'm st stuck in German, uh, den Stab überbrechen, um, I, you know, like I, I, I don't want to, um, you know, like denounce the IRC for what it did during the 1950s or so. I just want to go against the grain, and it's it's like humanitarian um, to see like humanitarianism as solely relief efforts, right? That you know, people are motivated by particular convictions, and you know, like particularly in this case, they are political, right? Um, and if you see, you know, like what happens in post-war Berlin. Um, straight up Stalinism is a uh, kind of repressive. I mean, there are, in 1947, there are 200 Berliners uh, that vanish in the streets every single month. Some of them happen to, to pop up uh, in repurposed concentration camps, such as the uh, Sachsenhausen one just outside of the city, city gates, right? So, I mean, there's a certain mm, internal logic to that, and which I can empathize. Um, however, we're now at the point, I feel, um, through, you know, like other layers of, you know, like various rather cynical deals of U.S. foreign policy uh, later on or during the time that, you know, like hum human rights or discussions on human rights are often seen nudged in uh, ways of, like, criticizing the shortcomings of or a hypocrisy of Western policy, right? And I wanted to just highlight that that wasn't always the case. But thanks. Fantastic. Um, there'll, be other, there'll be another opportunity if you have questions for Scott um, when we get to the end of the next presentation, um, for which I am delighted to, uh, to welcome David Zimmerman, who is um, a military historian at the University of Victoria. And for him, this is something that he found that he turned out to be really interesting in, interested in, which is a sideline from his usual military history. So, David. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I want to first of all compliment the organizers of the conference uh, for all sorts of reasons. Um, one is that they managed to hold this particular panel and they managed to do it in reverse chronological order, but in very strictly, perhaps Germanic, alphabetical order. Um, and I want to just reflect very quickly about a thought I had as I was coming in from Newark Airport on Sunday, and I was wondering what the traffic was going to be like through the Holland Tunnel, which I think I've been through twice since 1968 when my family left New York. I used to drive with my grandfather who had a business in Patterson, New Jersey, and he would commute to his home in Flatbush in Brooklyn. And I was wondering about islands, because I just come from my very own semi-tropical Pacific Island, where the traffic reports, and you'll get a kick out of this, usually start off with about how many ferry weights there are to get off the island to the mainland. And I started to think about islands because islands are really, in many ways, what this is all about. Because islands really are what universities are. And they're islands in the storm, but they require you to bridge, or in the case of Vancouver Island, take a ferry to get to them. And the reality is how we get to 
those islands. And if you're cast out from your place of refuge, which is a university for an academic, to another place, another university, is a very, very difficult proposition indeed. And I make no apologies for being a historian of institutions. And understanding how institutions work often reveals much about what happened. And in terms of the 1930s, in, let's see if I get this right. Nope. Ah. In terms of the 1930s, of course, there was a res collective response throughout the Western world to events in German universities, the mass dismissals. And I placed here a chart. The chart's almost unreadable. The numbers, actually, the total numbers are irrelevant because they're always wrong. But the relative numbers are important, that there's no question that the vast majority of refugee scholars that found placement were in Great Britain and in the United States. And this is the story, which amazing to me has never really been told, about the relationship between the two major organizations that rescued scholars. And this is, in fact, uh, newspaper stories. The one on, on here is the first announcement of the first dismissals in April 1933. Next to it is the announcement of the British organization, the Society of Protection of Science and Learning, or the Academic Assistance Council, as it's called, before 1935. And then the formation of the American Emergency Committee a little bit later in the summer of 1933. In fact, the two organizations did write post-war histories. And the two post-war histories mostly ignore each other. There's a little section in the two uh, official histories written after the war. But really, they don't talk much about how much these two organizations relied on each other. The organizations, however, had some remarkable similarities. Both were founded within months of the first dismissal from German universities. The Academic Assistance Council, or the SPSL, had as its presidents Lord Rutherford, uh, with other leading professors forming an executive board. The board left the overall manager of the council to two co-honorary secretaries, Sir William Beveridge, principal of the London School of Economics, and Professor C.S. Gibson, Chair of Chemistry at Guy's Hospital Medical School. Walter Adams, a young economic historian, was hired to run the council's day-to-day -day operations as its executive secretary. The American Emergency Committee was overseen by a general committee of leading American scholars and a small executive committee under the chairmanship of Professor Livingston Ferrand, president of Cornell University. It was managed by Dr. Stephen Dugan, director of the Institute for International Education, and, and I believe a former professor of political science at the College of the City of New York. And, this, and he was the secretary, and his co-secretary was no less a figure until 1935 of Edward R. Murrow, who of course later on became famous as a CBS reporter. Other active members of the committee, hev heavily involved in coordination with the British organization, was Dr. Alfred Cohn, a scientist at the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research. Almost from the beginning, both the Academic Assistance Council and the AC realized the only possible solution to the academic refugee crisis was the creation of an international movement to assist them. As well, early discussions between those involved in setting up academic relief organizations recognized the requirements to coordinate their activities. Far from events in Germany, the Americans understood the need to have someone observing the situation firsthand. In August 1935, the American Committee arranged for E.W. Baxter Collins, professor of German at Columbia University, to spend one year in Europe, and I think I've gone ahead one too many slides, in Europe acting as liaison with the Academic Assistance Council. Baxter Collins' reports on the AC begin in September 1933. He outlined the detailed dossiers that display scholars in the most important fields. These files were assembled by requesting a volunteer expert in each field to assume the responsibility of gathering from other scholars in England and elsewhere all available information. Baxter Collins agreed with Walter Adams that London is a logical place to have the clearinghouse for all kinds of information. Baxter Collins wrote to New York that he agreed with this approach since there was already confusion and duplication of labor. <laughs> 
He warned that this scheme to go forward, the AC would need financial su support from the American Committee to allow enlarging their already inadequate staff. In practice, right from the beginning, the Academic Assistance Council operated as a central clearinghouse for information on displaced scholars. But it wasn't for two more years that the formal arrangements between the American Committee and the British were worked out. There were certain problems. First of all, money, the root of all evil, perhaps, and international complications. Both the AC and uh, the, the American Emergency Committee and the AC raised money to, up, to provide grants to support displaced scholars. Their major donors were Jewish charities. The AAC, the American organization, was more heavily reliant on Jewish support, and in fact was largely f founded with seed money from two New York-based Jewish charitable foundations. The AAC was also able to draw on the resources of the Rockefeller Foundation, which ran its own independent grant program to support displaced scholars and often matched AEC grants. The quest for funding was an ongoing one and caused friction between all organizations, including those on the continent, trying to aid displaced scholars. Initially, Beveridge, who took the lead in raising funds for the British organization, tried to raise money where he had gotten it for the, eight, for the um, London School of Economics in the 1920s from large American foundations, such as the Rockefeller and the Carnegie Corporation. But his efforts failed. The failure of Beveridge fundraising efforts almost led to the collapse of the Academic Assistance Council in early 1934. Applications to small British charitable trusts and banks were rejected. The famous fundraising rally, which I have a pit of the program here, that featured in Albert Hall in October 1933, featuring his keynote speaker, Albert Einstein, was in reality a near disaster, providing the council with only a small amount of money. A further grant from the Central Jewish Fund and a public appeal only just managed to keep the AC going into 1935. The AAC, the Americans viewed with alarm efforts by all European academic relief organizations to garner funds from large American private funding agencies, particularly the Rockefeller Foundation. This foundation supported the AAC's work, made competing applications a natural concern. Only in September 1935, after several unsuccessful applications to American foundations, did all the surviving European academic relief organizations agree to the Americans' demands to cease applying to American foundations for major funding. The decision significantly improved relations between the two organizations. While the SBSL stayed away from the Rockefeller Foundation, the American Emergency Committee worked with the British to secure special funding from the Carnegie Corporation in, Carnegie Corporation. in 1934, the corporation agreed to provide grants to support refugee scholars for up to two years in universities throughout the British Empire. The program was greeted with great enthusiasm by the American and British relief organizations and the leaders of most universities eligible for the programs. I'm not going to go into detail about that program, uh, but certainly there are complications with the British and the American organizations working effectively together to smooth out the problems with the Carnegie corporations. One of the current concerns of both organizations, which shared was the effort to create some sort of overarching international organization to coordinate the aid to refugee scholars and that it, this not be allowed to interfere with their national programs. Baxter Collins had seen the AAC as a logical choice for being the lead relief agency, while the other members of the American Committee did agree that the British organization had a crucial role to play they worried that the Academic Assistance Council might usurp the power of American universities to select their own candidates for placement grants. The issue of international leadership and coordination was made more complicated by the appointment in late 1933 of James MacDonald as the League of Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. MacDonald created an expert committee dealing with, with academics and appointed Dr. Wel Walter Kochnik and the Austrian Jewish political scientist as its secretary. Kosnick played the lead role in trying to formalize the international coordination of efforts to assist academic refugees. Kosnick's appointment was strongly opposed by the British organization, fearful the International Committee would siphon off national funds and perhaps to achieve the long sought after major foundation grants to support the international effort. Kosnick, in turn, 
was very critical of the AAC's opposition to the international agency efforts to coordinate academic relief. Kostnick informed Morrow and other members of the American Committee that the real objections of the British organization was that it might interfere with their plans, and this is a quote, to get into their own hands the placement of all displaced scholars. Alfred Cohn, who represented the AC at some of the earliest meetings of the expert committee, was sensitive to the British concerns. However, Cohen believed that the High Commissioner would be crucial in the long-term planning and coordination of efforts to find permanent placement for those ousted from German universities. Ultimately, neither the British fears or the Americans' hopes for the High Commission would be realized. MacDonald failed to garner major international support for the wider efforts to assist those trying to escape Germany and resigned his position in January 1936. The expert committee, however, did make one invaluable contribution to the academic relief efforts by facilitating the formal working relationships between the AC and the SBSL and the American Emergency Committee. I'm just wondering how many in this room recognize this form. If you've worked in the area of refugee academics in the 1930s, you should. This is the standard application form, which I had always thought until I wrote this paper, this was created by the British organization. And here is the very same document. This is an application by a German physicist, sorry, a Czech physicist who actually died in the Shoah. He did not succeed in getting out, an important point that many of them did not survive. This is his application in the American Emergency Committee files here in New York at the public library. It's a carbon copy. In fact, the two organizations agreed to develop this form collectively. And this is a bit of detail. Again, the same form, the same part of that form, absolutely identical because it simply is a carbon copy. The Americans actually had input in this form. They suggested various things be added to it. Amongst them included whether or not the scholar had actually been dismissed, because many people were fleeing Germany before they were dismissed and they were reluctant to help those that didn't have to leave. But another question which posed more issues is the question of whether or not they were Jewish. And the British just simply agreed to these changes, put it onto the form, and there's no explanation given of why the Americans required this, but given the importance of the, of the American committees trying to prevent anti-Semitic views stopping their efforts, were they asking this question to identify whether a scholar fleeing Germany was Jewish? I'm not sure, but it appears likely. Two other aspects of the formal working relationships were established in 1934. The Emergency Committee, I'm sorry, one of the things that I should mention here is through the efforts of McDonald's Committee and Kochnig, the American Committee provided funds indirectly to the British Committee to pay for all this extra secretarial work because the British Committee simply couldn't afford it. So the, Brit the Americans gave money to McDonald, McDonald gave it to the British, because the Americans didn't want to give it directly to the British. Two other aspects of the formal working relationship between the two organizations were also formalized in 1934. They developed a code for telegrams to save costs. More significantly, the British agreed to share confidential access assessments of displaced scholars with the American Committee, which made it far easier for them to suggest suitable people to American universities. This is a rare actual voting form where they actually voted on candidates to rank them A, B, C, D. Only A and B, by the way, were considered for placement. C and D, forget it, you're out. Sounds like an academic tenure track job search committee to me. But the, the realities was, the, uh, if you lost this particular competition, of course, your fate was much worse than simply not getting a tenure track job. Unfortunately, while the AAC was satisfied with its working relationship with the SBSL, the Americans ignored the biggest single issue that continued to divide the two academic assistance organizations. The SBSL and the AAC both walked a dangerous political and social tightrope made worse by the ravages of the Great Depression. Getting permission from governments for displaced scholars to settle in Great Britain or the USA from Central Europe was not easy. The goal was to avoid any public upset about these foreign academics flooding into their respective countries. The committees needed to minimize any potential backlash from American and British scholars and graduate students caused by the arrival of these potential 
competitors for scarce jobs. Arousing anti-Semitism remained an ongoing worry. Senior British scholars who agreed to support William Beveridge's blueprint for creating the AC insisted that the Jewishness of the problem had to be played down as much as possible. As a result, Professor Jar Charles Singer, one of the leading British Jewish academics, a, a pioneer in the history of medicine, the co-author of the basic plan for the British Academic Relief Organization, was deliberately excluded from the executive committee of the board because he was Jewish. In the USA, the dangers of arousing anti-Semitism and an academic backlash from unemployed or poorly paid scholars was even greater than in Britain. From its founding, the ACSBL launched widely advertised public appeals for donations, particularly targeting professors and university leaders. The AAC, in contrast, avoided any public fundraising campaign lest they draw too much unwanted attention to their work. For similar reasons, while the British secretly lobbied quite openly for post-secondary institutions to create positions for refugee scholars, the AAC never solicited for new positions, but only reacted to fu funding requests made directly by individual colleges or universities. And by the way, this uh, newspaper article here, this is for the famous Heidelberg, I think it's the 375th anniversary celebrations, which British universities boycotted and many American universities sent delegates to, despite the public aware knowledge this was going to be a Nazi celebration. Um, most of the tensions between the SPSL and AC hinged on this crucial difference in their modus operandi. To the leadership of the SPSL, particularly Walter Adams, the executive secretary, and his successor, David Claycorn Thompson, the AC's passive approach suggested they were not doing everything in their power to find spaces for those dismissed from their academic post in Germany. The SBSL continued to press the Americans to be more dynamic in finding op openings for displaced scholars. This effort was further fueled by the rather unambitious goal of the American Committee in the early years to place just 50 refugee academics. In March 1934, Adams wrote that the SBSL was maintaining or had placed three times that number of, and then the American organization, while other relief agencies had found work for an equal number. This left, Adams explained, 700 displaced scholars, of which 300 certainly deserved to be placed. As it became clear that the academic refuge crisis would be long term, both the Americans and British committees renewed their effort to rescue refugee scholars. The Assistance Council rebranded itself the SPSL, while, the, while in cooperation with the Rockefeller Foundation, the AAC expanded its efforts beyond the initial 50 foreign scholars. Yet the AAC would not change either its fundraising or placement methodology. In the spring of 1935, Edward Morrow explained to Adams the AAC had debated at great lengths the merit of a public appeal, but decided against it. It was considered unwise in view of the existing anti-foreignism to publicize too widely our activities on behalf of displaced scholars. Moreover, it was the general indifference to the crisis in American University who viewed the mass dismissals of Central European scholars rather than a fundamental threat to academic freedom, but instead as a European Jewish problem. Part of this attitude, Morrow believed, undoubtedly had its roots in latent anti-Semitism, which in my judgment is increasing very rapidly over here. Despite these concerns, the SPSL will continue to press the AAC to do more. The frustration of the British were compounded by the increased number of refugee academics, more and more of whom came from outside of Germany. They, uh, the SBSL decided to take its own practical way by sending young scholars specifically excluded by the American Organization for Placement in the United States, sending them as academic tourists with a two-way ticket and enough money to visit as many universities as possible to plead in person for a position in the United States. How am I doing for time? Five minutes? OK. Three. Three minutes? OK. It's unclear how often this happened, but the very existence of this grant infuriated the AAC's executive. This fundamental difference between the AAC and SBSL came to the head in the winter of 1939, when the second executive or, uh, secretary of the organization, David Claycorn Thompson, who had replaced Adams as general secretary of the SBSL a few months earlier, made an ill-considered journey to see for himself 
or was being done to increase the number of displaced scholars in North America. Unbelievably, Thompson made his journey without informing the American organization. And the American organization only found out about Thompson's impending visit when a New York Times reporter, who I don't know how we got the story, informed them that the British were sending this representative over. This created an absolute fury in New York at the American Emergency Committee's office. The Americans demanded that the British stop this visit, which had Thompson visiting American universities, particularly in the Midwest and the Far West. The British simply point blank refused to heed the American demands. The Americans agreed to meet with Thompson in New York to discuss with him how, on, how, how risky his visit was, how it might provoke anti-Semitism, how it might bring down their entire operation. And Thompson simply dismissed the Americans' concerns. In desperation, the American organization wrote extensively letters, memos, telegrams, to everyone they could think of, Carnegie Corporation, Rockefeller Corporation, the British, demanding Thompson be stopped, but he wasn't. In the end, they even wrote to Walter Adams, who had now stepped down from the SPSL, asking him to do something. Adams wrote a soothing letter attempting to reassure them that the intent of Thompson's missions was to force closer cooperation between the American Emergency Committee and our association. But it didn't work. In the end, this dispute should have broken them apart, but it didn't. At the very end, Adam wrote a letter to the Americans stating this, that the war in Europe would transfer, uh, that he wrote this. In the last paragraph of his letter, he said, Adam stated, and this is in the spring of 1939, the smell of war is now putrefying every form of activity in Europe, and it looks as though we shall have to survive in this atmosphere, not only for several more months, but for several more years. It would be tragic, Adams concluded, if by some stupidity on our side or some purely administrative fault, one of the few good things being done anywhere, this work for the display scholars, this work for the display scholars should be injured when so little else that is really worth doing is being done. Ultimately, the Americans heeded Adams' advice. The two organizations smoothed over their differences and when the war started, they continued to work effectively together, as effectively as was possible to do, particularly with Britain at war in the United States until December 1941, and neutral. Thank you very much. Okay, um, if you could stay. Mm -hmm. and, um, and if Scott and uh, uh, Matthias could um, join us up at the table here. Um, but before we go on to the next phase, Question specifically for David. Perhaps somebody else? Okay, you win again. <laughs> Trying to be even handed here. You're a Canadian. Well, you're a Canadian worker, I guess. But what, what about them? They had a bad policy. Uh, they don't want Jews in Canada. Did they participate? There's plenty of. Uh, I've, I've written an article about it, mm. cited in the paper. Uh, which, sorry, which um, appeared in the Canadian Historical Review about 10 years ago. Um, the Canadian record is appalling. There's no question about it. And in many ways, Canada's response to the current refugee crisis, which I think is one of the best, certainly in, the, certainly in North America, certainly, well, we have the Americans to compare it to. I apologize. Um, it has been extraordinary, and part of it is because of a lingering feeling of guilt about how badly we behaved. Uh, but in terms of academic refugees, right now American universities are probably doing more simply because, you know, this is my comment that I made last night about someone from Princeton telling us how to deal with the refugee crisis. Canadian universities are richer than any university in the third world, but we're much poorer than any of the rich universities in the United States. Okay. Um, questions for any of our panelists? Um, thoughts that you might wish to add? Things you'd like them to discuss? What? Silence? There must have been brilliant papers. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you mentioned that numbers are very hard to verify. and um, the, 
book by Stephen Duggan and Betty Drury of the um, Committee in Aid of Displaced Foreign Scholars, uh, records that the US took in 330 um, academics from Germany and Western Europe. How does that correspond to the research that you've done? Um, to tell you the truth, I've mostly worked on the British organization. Problem is the British organization, they ceased publishing annual reports with statistics from 1938 to 1946. They're too busy in the war, and in fact, as well, all the men that work for that organization leave for war work. And Elizabeth uh, Simpson, who is the, actually just the secretary, becomes the executive ser secretary of the organization. Everyone who knows the SPSL history knows about her. She stays with the organization for many, many decades. Um, and the British organization is involved in many other things, such as getting a lot of these poor refugee scholars out of internment camps where they were thrown into with Nazis in 1940. So I can't verify the figures. And in fact, one of the things I'm increasingly made aware of is how many scholars simply slipped through that net. That massive encyclopedia that was done of, of displaced intellectuals, in, in my experience, they get they probably got less than half of certainly the academics that I've been interested in. And it, it's remarkable, and particularly if you perished during this time, the traces of you are very, very hard to find. So figures, I, I've just given up trying to give absolute figures. I think relative figures are much better. On the question of figures, I know that if you try to trace how many people were supported by Rockefeller, you will also find great confusion on the website, in the archives, et cetera. So this seems to be a general problem in this country as well. I, I guess I just wanted to ask Matthias the same question uh, that I asked Scott. I mean, the Ford Foundation, you know, it, re it sounds, the narrative to me is just a kind of deeply embedded Cold War move. I, I should, should I read it differently um, on the part of the Ford Foundation? Can you talk a little bit about their kind of connection to a scientific community uh, here? Can you talk about, you know, the ways in which they resisted perhaps uh, that kind of crude instrumentality? And on the recipient side, I also had a question, which was, you know, as an economist, I think about kind of foreign investment into the country, um, and does it distort the economy in any way? Uh, you know, I, you didn't say a lot about kind of how the recipient governments res were, were responding to this kind of inward investment, if you will. And, I, you know, it seems to me they were absorbing it as, as capital. And again, am I reading that too crudely? Well, from, I think from the side of the Ford Foundation, it is very clearly, as you said, a uh, Cold War story. I don't know if there is much more to add. The interesting question is the other side. Why did the communist governments actually agree uh, to, to sign this, uh, these agreements? What did they expect from that? And um, I think my impression is, but I, this, this is what I said in the end, I must verify this from, from Communist Party archives, that the Polish and the Yugoslav governments really actively sought much deeper, um, much more closer contact with the West, in particular in the sphere of the social sciences. They really expected here um, a lot of input to, you know, um, modernization. Um, the, the issue of ec economics was raised before. Reform economists had a very particular position in many East European countries. They had much, much larger degrees of freedoms, especially from the 70s onwards, than, for example, sociologists. That is even true for the for the USSR. Um, so I think this is this is the, the more the more troubling, more interesting, more interesting side actually to the story. From the side of the Ford Foundation, it's clear what they wanted. Um, the you asked about which organizations were involved, which academic organizations. Um, it seems in the beginning especially, it were especially um, institutions that had East European studies running and, and they, they were most interested. Columbia University was um, probably the biggest uh, target institution. 
um, also the University of Indiana, where this um, other Soviet-U.S. Uh, exchange program was organized, and a couple of others. But it, it, were, it was. They're a, not going to the top scientific communities in sociology, anthropology, economics. It depends. The the, the polls. Study, yeah. Well, from the American side, the interest was largest there in area studies. Mm -hmm. From the other side, it was it was actually where the centers of, of well, the, for Polish sociology, it's very clear they all went to Lassesfeld and Merton and wanted to learn, to learn about empirical methods. So interesting. Mm. Yes, go ahead. Um, <coughs> could, if I could latch on to it, I mean, um, Jane had invited us to also think about this uh, collaboratively, and you know, I don't want to preclude any <laughs> conversation. Uh, between us, but the, the Ford Foundation one, one, one shouldn't underestimate uh, their um, policies, but also shouldn't reduce it. Yes, they are a Cold War um, organization at this stage, um, but they are fighting the Cold War differently uh, because, and this would be a question uh, also for, for Matthias, I mean, is this a coincidence that the first East European um, program stops in 1953? because there's a thing going around, especially in West Berlin, it's called McCarthyism. Um, and this is uh, the, uh, the heads of the Ford Foundation are investigated by the junior senator of Wisconsin. At this point, his uh, henchmen, uh, Roy Cohn, G. David Schein, go to West Berlin, uh, go, you know, like find leftist books there in, in the, you know, like libraries, or American-sponsored libraries, and start um, actually redacting them. Um, so the, the, there, there is, and at this point, the Ford Foundation steps in as sort of like a semi-official financier of, you know, like less uh, for like the cultural Cold War, some initiatives that are not about, you know, like nuclear arsenals, uh, missiles, etc. And I mean, it begs the larger question. I mean, you know, like these. Maybe these folks were a little more efficient in uh, waging the Cold War, understanding it not, you know, like American, I feel American conservatism always has seen um, the Cold War or, or communism as a conspiracy. And Cold War liberals, even, especially if they have like a, you know, like left wing past themselves, see it as a perversion of ideals they share, which they make a lot, uh, which I think they make a lot more nuanced programs and offerings out there. And I would see the Cold War or the, the programs across the Iron Curtain also in that context. Interesting. This is a question, but also a kind of um, observation. Could one not also argue that as far as programs in, as far as the creation of such programs in Eastern Europe um, was taking place, that one's dealing with a collection of people in academies of sciences, for example, who were opportunists, like everybody else. And we tend to assume that, um, that on the East European side, there's a unanimity of, of opinion um, which probably didn't exist. Um, the academies of sciences particularly were in many cases simply collections of scholars who were attempting to be scholars under very difficult circumstances and used the rhetoric of Eastern Europe in order to achieve their objectives. Is that a reasonable way of looking at this? That goes to me, I guess. To anybody uh, who would like to answer it. Um, well, the selection of people where they're opportunists, uh, at least for the two programs I described for Poland and Yugoslavia, I think this, this cannot be upheld that way because it really, the interesting thing is that this was very, very broad uh, class of people. If you, if, if you look at them, some of them were later dissidents, yes, but some of them were actually quite close to the party. Some of them were government officials. Uh, many of them were actually pre-war intellectuals that had very little to do with, with the Stalinists. That, for, that, that is true for, for Poland. The Yugoslav story is a bit different, but again, um, the sheer number that, that 188 people from Yugoslavia within this first decade, this is when institutionalization of the social sciences had just begun. This means this is a very, very large chunk of, 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 of the whole social science scene that received the scholarship. So there was actually very little uh, political selection criteria within this first period. 
A very different story, of course, are the academies of science exchanges with the Soviet Union. Um, but even there, I would like to warn calling them all opportunists because, as I said before, in some spheres, like in reform e economics, these were very serious scholars. Um, they were, of course, uh, they had limits in expression to a degree, but these were serious scholars, and, and the American counterparts are very interested in the actual scholarship, uh, and they traded with each other. Thank you. Another question? Thank you for all your talks. This is a question I could have placed with probably in all of the panels, but I forgot. Let's turn to another perspective um, about women in the, in the scholarly exile. What is about, what is, is the number of women in all your cases, or in case of you, Marie Juchatz, for example? Was she also part of that organization? I think, in general, that is one of the topics we all have forgotten in our talks, to include the gender perspective. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, no, it's, it's, it's an excellent question, um, which is uh, somewhat, uh, for me, harder to answer simply because of the numbers, the members of this network uh, are, you know, like, for instance, uh, well, what I have left out right now is that um, you know, like the, the AFGF crew uh, was, because of what happened in Paris or so, was uh, very, very um, antagonistic or that had like a little spat, not, not, well, it was little spat, but, you know, like really, really serious within German left-wing um, exile circles up there on, in Washington Heights. Uh, with the German labor delegation, the sort of like mainline SPD wing where Juchatz was, was active, right? So, and then there are these sort of like mm, Neubeginnen uh, crew uh, guys out there who are surely, you know, like for equal rights, etc. But if you then look at uh, the um, working atmosphere that, the, that happens then, I mean, can talk about mid-century ideas or notions of masculinity or so because it's sort of like reminiscent of um, you know like um, the Mad Men TV show uh, from from a few years back. I mean, it's testosterone power, boozy, uh, a lot of smoking uh, going on, and um, you know, like sure there there, there are uh, and, and also with the sort of like cult of of, of domesticity with uh, where you know like. There are Grüße von Haus zu Haus, uh, auch an die Werte Gattin, uh, even though, uh, for, for, for instance, the, the main connection between Hirschfeld and the Ford Foundation was, um, so I should, should mention Hirschfeld, one of his uh, friends that he made here, I, I only referenced it briefly in the paper, was Shepard Stone, who later became the international um, uh, affairs or, or, or chief of international affairs at the Ford Foundation and they got to know each other because his wife, uh, German-born wife, uh, worked also at the OSS and was Hirschfeld's supervisor at that point. So you have the connection there. If you look at then who, you know, like whose papers, you know, like her papers, some of them are filed under she her husband's Shepard Stone's papers at Dartmouth. So, you know, like well, that's depressing. Um, could we have... Um, Sorry. Sure. In this issue of social concern, my colleague, Ellen Freeberg, is here. Of the Mayflower group at the Davis School, the University in Exile, one was a woman, Frieda Wunderlich. And Ellen and her two colleagues have co-written a really beautiful paper that's coming out in this issue of social research on the gender issue in uh, exile scholars. And it's a detailed study of Wunderlich. And it's not a story of her heroic travels to the US. It's really a story of how did a woman make it within uh, German academe and German government circles to rise to the level where we, she was on the list of those selected. Sorry, could I just respond to that? Because in the 1930s, women had a few problems. And in terms of getting recognized as scholars, and I want to explain to you what I mean by this. I'm doing right now a book on refugees, academics, and what made the terrible mistake of going to the Soviet Union. And I've expanded the definition of academic refugees so that I have three women in my study. And the biggest problem that 
women had when dealing with these international organizations for academic relief was that many of them, once they were married, had left the academy. And they were very, very insistent uh, that these people actually left an academic position. And one of the things that for a lot of these women was, were they accepted? In fact, one of the people I'm studying is a musicologist who both the American and the British Committee decided were not was not a legitimate academic because of the position she held in Germany. Uh, at the same time, there was another factor, and this is often forgotten, and the American Emergency Committee particularly was discriminatory in this. Where women were involved in the academy was often after they finished and before they were married, and this is just the realities of the time. And um, the American Emergency, Emergency Committee, as well as the British to a certain extent, discriminated against young scholars. Young scholars were the threat to the graduate students they feared the graduate students mobilizing. And so they really tried to keep themselves to people that were well-established at universities. And you know, the, so that actually limits the number of women. On the other side, there were women's organizations, academic organizations that specifically helped women. And that was something that wasn't available to men. And they did do very effective work at placing those, many of these women academics. Um. This wonderfully provoking topic on which to end this particular session. Um, it is now time for tea. And so I'm going to thank, thank you again, gentlemen, for wonderful presentations. Thank you so very much. Can we thank our panelists?